Partners. And welcome everyone, and thanks for joining us today for our first webinar of this new 2021-22 season of the Smart History Commons Conversations. Uh, I am Lauren Kilroy Eubank, the Dean of Content and Strategy at Smart History, and I'm really excited to kick off uh, with today's talk. And uh, I did want to mention, at least since this is our very first webinar, that uh, we have a really exciting program that we've put together between now and early April. And so I hope people will take a look and sign up for future webinars. Our next one is two weeks from now. Uh, I am delighted today to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Rachel Kauser, who is a professor at Brooklyn College and the Graduate Center at the City University of New York. Uh, she teaches courses on a wide spectrum of topics related to the ancient Mediterranean, among other things. And she will be talking with us today about the Parthenon, offering some teaching strategies and helping us think through maybe new ways to approach it or reframe our classes. She also has, I have to just plug her, a fabulous essay that's on Smart History currently about this that you can go read at any time. Uh, I have no doubt there will be questions for her at the end of her talk and just a, uh, a reminder that it's best to put them in the Q&A rather than the chat function. It just makes it easier for me to field them to Rachel at the end. So thank you so much. And I'm going to turn it over to her. Great. Thank you so much, Lauren, um, Beth, and Stephen, and uh, all of you for coming. I'm delighted to see so much interest in the Parthenon and delighted to have uh, be able to have this conversation with you today. Um, Tell me if there's any problem and then hopefully you can see my slides. So I wanted to start um, by talking briefly about why the Parthenon is so hard to teach. I have always found it very difficult to teach when I supervise graduate teaching fellows at Brooklyn College, they find it hard to teach. I'd love to talk to you guys in the Q&A more about like what makes it difficult from your perspective. Um, for me, there are a couple of things that, that are really challenging. One is the just incredible familiarity of the Parthenon, that it has this kind of almost cliche quality. It looks like every bank we've seen, every courthouse building, like every ranch house in New Jersey that wants to look important throws some columns on the front. So trying to get beyond that and to recapture some of what it looked like to the people who first saw it is, is challenging, but I think critical. Um, the second thing that I think for, makes the Parthenon difficult for me to teach is this, this kind of aura of reverence that people have about it. They say the Parthenon, and then they go, democracy, classical Athens, you know, Western civilization, the Greek miracle. And, yeah, I, I, as a scholar, I have never felt that reverence was the way I wanted to approach the things I taught, teach. And in an era when, you know, so much, uh, so many imagery, so much imagery of classical civilization has been appropriated by, for example, white supremacists, I think this should give us a bit of pause. Um, I'm going to argue that we should keep teaching the Parthenon, but but differently. Um, so why do I think we should still keep teaching the Parthenon? Um, one thing in a survey course is that I think it's really helpful to helping students understand what comes later. If one's exploring art history as a historical discipline, so much later response to the classical ideal, response to the architectural iconography of the Parthenon, it's just useful as a setup. Um, but the other thing, and perhaps a more key thing for me, is that precisely because, in my view, it's a, it's a challenging monument, it helps to model the kind of complex, nuanced um, historical discussion that we hope that we are going to have with our students in college. Um, and I very much want to say to them, you know, art is not innocent, and not all art expresses purely good things, but we should learn about it and we should think about it, just think about it skeptically. So um, now I'll get off my soapbox and talk about how I actually teach the Parthenon. 
Um, so I think to defamiliarize it, part of what I want to do is to remind the students of the context of the Persian Wars of 490 and 480 to 79 BCE. Um, and I say, okay, you know, when we're talking about the Parthenon, often when this is the kind of map we show. And you say, oh, you know, here's Athens, then there's Delphi, there's Olympia, you know, this is, this is how we understand classical Greece. But really, if we want to understand classical Greece, the map we should be looking at is this one, which shows the enormous Persian empire. It's everything that's outlined in red. Um, it goes from uh, Pakistan over here to Egypt, well into Europe. Um, and, and, and this is Greece over here on the periphery. Uh, and that's important because then when the Persian Wars happens, the Persians are trying to invade Greece. And it's this David and Goliath struggle. You know, the Persians are the wealthiest, the most powerful, the most militarily effective empire in the world at the time. And everybody else they'd chosen to invade had uh, sooner or later been conquered. And so when the Greeks managed to turn them back, for the Greeks, it's this huge, huge deal. Uh, and it's, they see it, I think, very much as a validation of their way of life and for the Athenians in particular of their democracy. Uh, and this so history is important, not only in just sort of understanding the kind of worldview of the Greeks in general, but important for the Parthenon in particular, because the Parthenon is kind of ground zero in the Athenians experience of the Persian Wars. Um, and that is because Athens, it's on the Eastern side of Greece. The Persians are coming from the East. Athens is the first big city they get to. And the Greeks can't defend it against this enormous overwhelming Persian uh, army. And the Athenians instead follow the advice of the Delphic Oracle, which told them to put their trust in wooden walls, which they interpret that as meaning their ships, sail away and stake their hopes on a naval victory. Um, then you eventually get that naval victory and finally turn back the Persians in uh, 479 uh, BCE. But before that, the Persians ruthlessly sacked the entire city of Athens. And particularly crushing for the Athenians is that they destroy all the temples on the Acropolis, the most sacred site in Athens. Um, among them, a building that we call the Older Parthenon. And you're seeing on the left, a kind of imaginative recreation of that building that was still being built at the time, um, as it is you know, in flames. And on the right, you see, sorry, I have to find where my, my there it is, my arrow. So the Parthenon is literally on the footprint of that older building. So the footprint is in this sort of brownish gold, uh, and the older Parthenon and the Parthenon itself is this plan in black, each of these is one of the columns. So it is a site that's deeply enmeshed in um, the history of the Persian Wars. And when the Athenians then come to rebuild, um, they have this kind of difficult time figuring out how much to look back and how much to look forward. So um, I give the students all this background in the history and then I say, all right, let's look at the monument a little bit and talk about what makes it striking and distinctive within um, the history of ancient art. Uh, and the first thing to say is to openly acknowledge that compared to the ziggurats and pyramids, for instance, which we've been likely showing our students in the earlier part of this uh, survey, um, the Parthenon is not enormous. Uh, it's a very human sized building. So it's about 100 feet long on the long side. It's only about 40 feet high. Um, it is not grandiose in scale. Uh, so that's not it at all. And so many of the earlier buildings had been just sort of overwhelming. 
with the pyramids. Um, so what is impressive? The first thing that I think mattered for the Athenians, which they were very proud of, was that it was made all of marble. It's the first, in fact, uh, all marble monumental temple on the Greek mainland. And marble is a very difficult uh, to, um, it's very hard to cut, it's very expensive, it's very dense, uh, and it has this kind of shimmer that uh, photos can't really do justice to, but when you go there and see it, you, you feel it's crystalline structure really gleams through. Uh, so that's one thing. A second thing is the pervasive symmetry that guides all of its uh, proportions. So, it, and it's a ratio of x to 2x plus 1, so 4 to 9, 8 to 17. And this guides everything from the ratio of the columns on the front to the columns on the side to the diameter of a column relative to its height throughout the building. Um, this likely isn't really perceived on any conscious level by the average Greek viewer, but it nonetheless has this kind of, um, you do perceive a kind of orderliness to the building. Um, and for the Greeks that was attractive, not only sort of on aesthetic grounds, but also sort of philosophically. A third thing that's extraordinary about the Parthenon is its execution. Um, so it's exquisitely well made. Uh, if you look at, for example, the um, steps here, there are some where you can't even see the join between two blocks because it's so well cut. Um, this pedimental sculptures on the top here, um, even their backs are exquisitely finished, despite the fact that no human being was ever going to see them. They were right up against the wall. Um, so they really made it as good as they could. Um, and I think very much not just for human viewers, but sort of for gods, after all, it's a temple. Um, a further thing is its integration of architecture with an extraordinary amount of sculpture for a Doric temple like this one, uh, meaning these very plain, simple column uh, capitals. It is just dripping with sculpture. It has the metopes, which are, sorry, all the way around on all four sides. Um, it had sculpture in both pediments, and then it had this frieze running all the way along on the interior of the building, as well as a 40 foot tall golden ivory statue is probably the most spectacular aspect of it. Um, and no building on the Greek mainland had done anything like this in the past. This was an extraordinary achievement. The final thing is that this is a deeply democratic building, not only in its kind of program, but also in how it was done. So this have two famous architects, Sictinus and Callicrates, and a famous sculptor, Phidias, working. Um, but it was overseen by a committee of ordinary Athenians. They published their accounts every year so that you had a sense of financial transparency. Um, everything was done by committee. The longer I spend as an academic on committees, the more astonishing I think this is. Um, so all of this, I think, is, is part of what, for the for the Greeks themselves made this an extraordinary building uh, and stand out within our history of, of art. Now I want to complicate things a little bit and I want to do so by looking at some of the sculptures, some of the best preserved sculptures, the sculptures of the South Side Medipi. Uh, the first thing to say is, okay, most of Greek art and certainly this is mythological and that you need to have a quick background in this myth. So all you really need to know is once upon a time in Greece, there was a wedding. And like many weddings, there were some guests that not everybody wanted to have come, but they were relatives, they had to be invited. These were the centaurs, half man, half horse. And um, every bride's nightmare, the centaurs came to the wedding, they got drunk, and they tried to abduct all the women. It was a great battle. Uh, eventually the men prevail. And the Greeks sort of saw this as an emblematic of a kind of 
victory of good versus evil, civilization versus barbarism. So when I tell the students this myth, and then I say, okay, so Greek art is great at telling stories. So you tell me here, who is winning in this, this battle between men and centaurs? And what are the details that indicate this? Well, it's a 50-50 chance of being right. So uh, generally speaking, someone is usually willing to say, okay, they think it's the men. And they know, we talk for instance, about how the man has this beautiful open pose and the centaur is kind of contorted and uncomfortable looking. How the man has this fantastic cloak, which, um, you know, frames his body so elegantly, whereas the centaur is completely nude. Um, that the man is in this man is in this very anchored pose. It's kind of like warrior two in yoga. And the centaur is pulled up and very um, unstable. Uh, and we, you know, it's absolutely, you were right. The man is winning here. And um, given that then who are the Athenians identifying with, do you think, in this image? And, you know, the students are pretty happy to say they're identifying with the man. This is the classical ideal. He is youthful, he is dynamic, he is powerful and shown in, you know, he's wonderful in action and all of this. And I say, okay, so if these are the Athenians, we know that um, you know this myth has all this resonance for the Greeks. Who are the Persians? And what is it saying about them? And one has to say, the Persians, this is the way that the Greeks are showing the Persians through myth. And they're showing them as the centaurs. That is, as these uncivilized, um, hubristic, dangerous animals. Um, to me, this is one of the things that is most troubling about the Parthenon is that the way in which through myth, um, they're talking about their history, but denigrating their opponents uh, as, as, as animals. Um, and I think, you know, that should give us all, for sure, pause. Um, however, I don't want to stop there, um, but turn then to another metope. This one, still from the south side, still the men versus centaurs, and I say, okay, so, you know, here on the left, got this beautiful man and so on, he's winning. Who is winning on the right? And how do we know here? And the students who are pretty proud of themselves by now at, at how they can read the bodies of Greek sculptures are pretty quick to say, things are not looking so good for the gentleman on the floor. Uh, looks like the centaur is gonna win this one. Um, I say you are absolutely right. And in fact, about a third of the South Side Metopes, the Metopes that show this battle between men and centaurs, the uh, centaur seems to be winning. And so then I asked them, and this is where it becomes this kind of accordion question, where I'm like, hmm, well, that is, it starts very narrow, but now it's starting to open out. Um, what is that telling us about how they understand their history? And what is that telling us about the Parthenon and its status as a monument? And the students think and sort of work through this for a bit. And usually we come to the sense that this is certainly a victory monument and they're showing you know, themselves as the victors and their enemies as these you know, lower life forms. 
but it's also a monument that speaks through myth very directly about fragility and loss. Um, and that seems appropriate for a place that is after all, not just um, a victory monument, but is also a war memorial on the site of the Athenians' most difficult experience in the wars. Um, and to me, this is, this is what is so, so compelling about the Parthenon. I think people tend to see classical Greek art as kind of this, you know, sort of bland middle ground. It's kind of like balanced and ordered and idealized, all the rest of it. And I always see it not as a balance, but it's like a balance, or it is a balance, but it's a balance between opposing tensions that are like pulling at each other. Um, uh, and that it is the balance achieved then by attempting to reconcile very difficult opposites. Um, and so that is why I keep teaching the Parthenon um, and why I'm so grateful to have done so today. Thank you. I'm good. Thank you so much, Rachel. Let me, you can, you can keep yourself unmuted here. That was wonderful. I feel like I learned a lot. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. Um, well, uh, we have about 10 minutes or so for Q&A and it looks like we have some questions being posted. So let me turn to those first. Um, the first question is, uh, well, first, someone thanked you for the great discussion and wondered about the metopes on the other sides that show showed famous battles as well, correct? And and were the the enemies on those metopes also conceived of as having real life counterparts? Absolutely, that's a very good question um, because this is, I think that throughout the program of the Parthenon. Um, they are thinking about the Persians and they show them, you know, they reference, so the battles on the other sides are Amazons. So then the Persians are the bad women. Um, and they're giants who are, uh, fighting the gods. So the giants are also bad in, um, Greek mythology. And then it's the Trojan war. Um, and the Trojan. So the other sides are not as well preserved. So I've shown you these, um, but because they were sort of chiseled down by likely by early Christians in the sixth century CE. Um, but we can see the same repeated patterns, particularly on the Amazonomachy, the, the battle between men and Amazons, where um, there's enough left so that we can see like when the uh, men are women winning and when the Amazons are winning. And it's, it's similar to the centaurs. It, it's the Amazons even win. That's, I mean, I, I've always found that so interesting. And as you were saying, this, this kind of disturbing way in which they're made into animals, but then, you know, also they're then transformed into women. And, and, uh, you know, that's always such an interesting conversation with students. Um, we have another question about the financial trend, the issue of transparency, the idea of financial transparency, and wondering mm -hmm. if maybe you could clarify that a little bit because didn't Pericles steal money from the Delian League to make the Parthenon? <laughs> well, he took money, but he was perfectly blunt about it. Um, it was transparently, uh, you know, by the Delian, so, the Delian League is this um, league of all the Greek states that assembled to fight the Persians, or many of the Greek states, not all of them, um, that assembled to fight the Persians in the um, wars of 490 and 480 to 79. Um, and once those wars are over, um, many of the other participants preferred to contribute uh, money rather than to continue sort of having to be, uh, have their ships and their soldiers ready. So there's this big tre uh, treasury of, of the money for that. Uh, initially it's placed on the island of Delos, hence the Delian League, 
But the Athenians then take it and bring it to Athens. And they say, basically, we're being the Greek world's policemen. So we should get this money to do what we want with. And if we are doing our job as policemen, you guys stay out of um, what we are doing. Um, you know, stay, don't, don't fuss at us about how we use the money. Um, and he then used some of it for, uh, among other things, funding the, the whole Periclean building program. So not just the Parthenon, but all the buildings on the Acropolis. Um, so one should say then that if the Parthenon is a democratic building, but it's also rather an imperial one. Particularly because if you tried to leave the league, you were sort of yanked back by the Athenians by force if necessary. Um, however, to each other, to the Athenians, there was a great emphasis on transparency. And one of the one of the slides I cut because I was like, oh, I really need, you know, I really need to keep this to a reasonable length, um, was a slide of one of these huge marble stelae. They're sort of big flat marble slabs painstakingly inscribed with the account. So like, you know, we paid this much money um, for this sculpture, this much money for that sculpture, you know, that they created for many of the years of the Parthenon and stuck up on the Acropolis. You can still see some in the Acropolis Museum today. So there is this real sense of them as trying to, um, for their own citizens, um, be clear about where the money is going. Follow the money. <laughs> well, we have we have received a bunch of other great questions. Okay. So um, I'm going to try to go through them in order, but they've okay. been coming in. So let's see here. It looks like um, we had a question about whether uh, a certain approach is maybe still valid. So um, someone asked, for instance, you know, how what and how do you teach about the Parthenon as a site of memory, especially regarding Athena and the pan athenaic procession? Um, you know, uh, this uh, the approach that this person has taken about the reconstruction after the Persian Wars, and is that still, uh, you know, a valid approach? Uh, I think certainly talking about the Parthenon as a site of memory is, is, is absolutely a valid approach. Um, the Talking about it in connection with the Panathenaic procession, which far precedes the Persian Wars and continued long after them, is certainly also, a, you know, there are many ways into the Parthenon. Um, I have emphasized this one about history and the, the site of the Parthenon. Um, but if one is thinking of it, particularly if one wants to take the approach of talking about it in connection to democracy, the fact that it is the sort of culminating place of this great communal festival of the Canethanate procession is uh, very valid. And if you wanna talk about the freeze, I like the metopes. I think somehow they're easier to kind of have students wrap their head around um, it, a few of them. But if you want to talk about the freeze, then that's the place to talk about the Canethanate procession because I would say it, it probably is depicted there in some form. Yeah. And we had a, a quick question, which was about the, the name of the stila that you were mentioning that shows the expenditures. Um, yeah, there are a bunch of them. If you Google, this is what I did, because they're like, <laughs> you know, they're named things like Inscriptiones Graeci 4859, which does not really help you very much. And I'm, I'm making up that number because they didn't, they didn't stick in my mind. But um, I Googled like Parthenon accounts inscription, um, or if you go to the website of the Acropolis Museum, they have a couple of them on there and they're really, they're fascinating. I mean, they're, they're great, weird things. Um, so, you know, absolutely include them. Now it looks like we've gotten a couple of questions or comments about the issue of color, of polychromy. Yes. Um, and wondering if you could, you know, how, how you discuss that issue, maybe in conversation with, with how you just um, presented the Parthenon. Yeah, um, I usually don't because I feel as though there's so much complexity to this building that, you know, I mean, at one point I took an entire semester on the Parthenon um, in graduate school. We only ever got to the sculpture. We didn't even touch the architecture. So um, 
so I usually leave out the issue of color, um, except to show them there's this great Al Makadama um, reconstruct, you know, painting from the 19th century that supposedly shows, you know, Phidias uh, and these ladies going to visit Phidias on the, um, and looking at the Parthenon frieze and showing it in color. And they, you know, yes, we know it was all in color. We see Greek art as white um, with all the problematic connotations that has, but it was vividly colored. It was probably kind of garish. Oh, the other thing I show them is, is the Nashville Parthenon reconstruction of the Athena Parthenos, which is like the country Western Athena. She's even got lipstick um, to remind them of just how gaudy Greek art could be um, and say, you know, this is just because it's been an outside for 2,500 years, not the way it originally was. Yeah, it's always shocking to students when they <laughs> when they see that, isn't it? Um, we have so many questions, and are you okay with staying on a little bit longer to to answer some of these? Okay, um, you know, this is like my ideal, right? <laughs> right. Uh, so we have a great question about the role, the possible role the Parthenon played during the Roman era. You know, did you know the, since the Romans are deriving inspiration from the Greeks? You know, what did they what did they use the Parthenon for? Or, you know, did they use it? Absolutely. I mean. It continues as a polytheist temple, as far as we can tell, right up until the time it's converted into a Christian church in the sixth century CE, um, in what was probably a rather contested conversion. Um, but yeah, I mean, the Parthenon, um, there's a small temple uh, to Roma and Augustus, which is right uh, to the east of the Parthenon, so you would have seen it. So Roma, the goddess of Rome, and Augustus, the first emperor, um, he puts it right smack dab on the Acropolis, which is, he was not a modest man. Um, <laughs> the emperor Nero one-ups him by putting an inscription to himself on the east frieze, I mean, on the east side of the Parthenon, um, which the Athenians subsequently and angrily take down, but there are still the holes where the inscription was on the Parthenon. So it is clearly still an important monument um, and other buildings on the Acropolis, particularly the Erechtheion, so the next door temple are explicitly emulated. So Augustus uses the same caryatids, those women with the, the like bitter columns um, in his forum of Augustus. And there are deliberate copies of those at the Erechtheum. So the Acropolis itself and particularly the Parthenon are still very potent monuments in the Roman era. Yeah, and, and I'll just, uh, once again, to, uh, for people who maybe missed my comment earlier, if, if you wanna read more about this, Rachel has a great essay on Smart History where she actually talks about this and kind of how, how it's presented today and what's been removed from these other, from these other eras that um, when we post this uh, conversation to Smart History, we'll have a link to that essay that people can uh, use as a resource too. Um, it's really interesting. Um, let's see, some more questions here. We had a couple of folks who were, who were curious about how, um, whether you think, whether you would describe the Parthenon and the Metapes and things as being with or without bias. You're totally biased. Are you kidding me? Um, I hope that was the point sorry, yeah. of my talk. Like, this is an extraordinarily seductive programmatic monument that has a strong ideological bias, which says we are the good guys and we are civilization and our enemies are the bad guys. And they are not civilization. They are barbarians. Um, I, yeah. I, I don't know how to say it more strongly than that. Um, doesn't mean we shouldn't study it, but does mean we should. Uh, I think there's something particularly about its naturalism and its idealization and so on, which makes it somehow kind of sugarcoat that bias. Um, but it's absolutely there. And so another, another question, I think, kind of building off of that is, you know, would you, uh, agree that the Parthenon was not only about a triumph of Athenian democracy, but also say a triumph of the Athenian empire. Yep, yep. 
Um, yes, I think it, the metopes thematize that less. Um, well, actually, what I should say is empire is weirdly not visible in the Parthenon and indeed in Athenian art in general. It's interesting because, you know, the, the Romans are totally open. You know, they are proud to celebrate that they have an empire. They cop to it like anything. And the Greeks, I think there is this feeling that the Athenians very much strongly have that democracies shouldn't be empires. That the people that they were fighting were an empire and they shouldn't be. And so empire is like their guilty secret. Um, so, I mean, you know, they've got a 40 foot tall golden ivory statue in the middle of the Parthenon. That is a very imperial thing to do. There's nothing that, you know, it's, it was, must have been like a quarter of the cost of the entire building. It's huge um, and very expensive. Um, but in terms of visually celebrating their empire, no. Um, I think they have a, the kind of trepidation about it that we see in, um, how shall I say it? Later democracies that don't want to be thought of as empires too. And then, and then that's a good comparison, right? That that kind of absence or decision not to, you know, so explicitly display empire, right? Um, and that's, I think that's always so useful for students to kind of see that, especially with something like the Parthenon. Um, so someone had an, an interesting question and I'm also curious, you know, we're, we're in the survey class, students are, you know, being introduced to something as complex as the Parthenon. Do you address the uh, controversy about the, um, you know, the Elgin marbles, you know, the Parthenon marbles in class or is it assignment or is, or, you know, do you broach that with your introductory students in a survey? Um, I usually wait to see if they talk about it. Um, I feel like, how can I say this? I feel like for me, when I'm talk, teaching the survey, I'm wanting them to think about a lot of big issues and there are better, there are better examples of questions about cultural patrimony or at least more egregious ones to me. Um, if asked, I will admit, and this is super unpopular, um, you know, that I don't think the British need to give them back. Uh, that I think that for me as an archeologist, um, what matters is often, you know, do we know where something comes from? Yes, we absolutely know where this comes from. The British Museum is not uh, hiding it. Is it accessible? Yes, it's very accessible. You can go to London and see this monument. Um, you know, can you study it? Absolutely. To me, where I feel more, you know, where I get more upset about museums is in museums that are continuing, you know, you go to the, a number of museums in the United States, for example, and you see these things that say recent acquisition in the classical um, wing and have, you know, provenance, perhaps Turkey. And yeah, that's the stuff that really bothers me. And that I feel as though having these arguments about the Parthenon could be a distraction for the ongoing looting of cultural heritage in places like Iraq or Afghanistan, God help us, or um, even indeed Greece. Um, so it's kind of like, that's what to me is the most, the, the, the stuff that makes me weep at night. Yeah. And, and, and uh, yeah, that, that makes, that makes sense. Um, do you have an example of uh, Persian art or architecture that you think is as equally biased, say, as the Parthenon sculptural program was, <laughs> but towards the Greeks? So is there a counterpart? No, I mean, the funny thing is that, you know, there's this great Robert Graves poem that goes something like, it's called the Persian version. And he goes, it's something like, right thinking Persians do not dwell upon that minor skirmish fought at Marathon. Because the thing is, from the perspective of the Greeks, this was a huge deal. But from the perspective of the Persians, this is like minor squabbles on the remote Western borderlands. 
Um, the Greeks are not that important to the Persians, I must say. Uh, and in consequence, their art, when it speaks about empire in, for instance, the Apodna release of, the, of Persepolis, you know, they sort of show all these people, it's like it's a small world. They're all dressed up in their native garb and they're all bringing their native products. Um, and there are certainly um, Greeks from um, the Western coast of Turkey among them, but the Persians never, you know, have this, I mean, there are some small seals that show Persians defeating Greeks, but it's never such a big deal to them, which I think is probably reasonable. Okay. <laughs> Perfectly yeah. defensible position on the part of the Persians. Yeah. And I think that map you showed earlier kind of helps to, to, to make that point, right? Um, and what you said about them. So yeah, I um well to be sensitive to to everyone's time, I thought I would just um end by uh just uh, as it, I guess citing two questions that I think are basic. And if you don't have answers for, maybe we can, you and I can talk and we can post them along with the webinar. And I think they're about resources. And the first one is about, you know, do you have a good site, website, or resource that you use to teach the Parthenon that shows the art, you know, within the Parthenon as it was in the fifth century, since, you know, so much of the art has been removed, it can be so challenging to teach. Mm -hmm. um, and, and kind of a, an addendum to that is, you know, have you ever, do you ever use the film Secrets of the Parthenon that I think was uh, PBS 2008? Like, is it, is it, is it legit? Is it a good resource for students to watch? You know, would you recommend it? You know, embarrassingly, I have <laughs> watched it. So I am not the right person to ask about this. Um, I will try to do that and get back to you guys. But in terms of resources, um, the Acropolis Museum has a very good website, which has a lot of material, um, including in English, um, and can be very helpful. Um, the other thing that I think is super helpful, actually, although it's not marble, is the Nashville Parthenon, because there they have this recreation. So you can get like, and they have a lot of pictures of it. The Nashville people are very proud of their status as Athens and the South. Um, and so, you know, you can get pictures of like all the menopes and, and they're kind of, you know, it gives you an idea of what it's like. It's, I think it's like limestone or something. So it doesn't have quite the shimmer. Um, but in terms of using it for your students to kind of walk them through the building, um, and particularly for showing them the Athena Parthenos is, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's great in a sort of frightening way, but it's great. Yeah, I would, I would second that. Well, thank you so much, Rachel, for your time and for your ideas and suggestions. Um, I, it sounds from, from all the comments we've been getting and thank yous, it seems like it was really uh, well received and people are very grateful. So um, we appreciate it. And uh, for those of you who are still here, like I said, we will, we will publish this on Smart History along with some of the resources that, that we've mentioned in this conversation along with some others that we hope uh, will be useful to everyone. So for now, we'll say goodbye and uh, uh, join us again in two weeks for a webinar on the Master of Calamarca's Angel with Archibus. And for now, we'll just thank you. All right, thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. <laughs>